now we'll introduce our final speaker in this panel, Jo Dobrow. Uh, jo Dobrow is an author and, in his own words, a recovering market executive. His 2014 book, Natural Profit, chronicled the development of the natural and organic foods industry. His latest effort, Pioneers of Promotion, examines the early roots of the marketing industry through the work of visionaries like John M. Burke of Buffalo Bills Wild West, Moses P. Handy of the World's Fair, the World, sorry, the World's Columbian Exposition, and Tody Hamilton of Barnum and Bailey's Greatest Show on Earth. Dobrow also has degrees from Brown and Yale universities. This morning, he's talking to us under the title, Jumping Jehoshaphat, the wit and marketing wisdom of Major John M. Burke. Well, thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you again. You've heard so many wonderful words of praise for Jeremy and the staff here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. But um, it really is a, a tremendous honor and a privilege for me to be here among so many distinguished scholars, uh, many of whose names and works have been familiar to me during my research and writing of uh, Pioneers of Promotion. And, uh, you know, honestly, I've, um, I've spent a lot of time in my career working with famous people. I ran a foundation for Cal Ripken Jr. I worked with Steve Case, uh, on and on and on. But to be in a room with uh, Patty Limerick and, and Louis Warden, Warren and, and uh, Bob Rydell, whose works on uh, the World's Fair have been so important to me, that is being starstruck. So I, um, I really appreciate it. And, and I also have to just say that it, it really, I mean, this, this is geeking out to in just incredibly specific stuff. You know, you spend time researching and writing a book. It's a very solitary experience. And then you, you kind of parachute into Cody, Wyoming, and here are people who care about how many different gravestones there were over Texas Jack's grave in Leadville, Colorado, or who are creating word maps like Jim and his team have done about the press coverage in, in Indiana. So um, I think that's just fantastic. Uh, in my family, there are uh, for college professors, so there are more degrees than in a man of radar range. I am not a PhD, I am but a lowly MBA, uh, but I did uh, study history under John Thomas uh, at Brown and under Howard Lamar at Yale. Uh, nevertheless, I, I really want to sort of make a disclaimer for you, and that is that the, my scholarship and the presentation that I'll give for you today have been created through a, a professional lens and that is of being a, a longtime marketing executive uh, who helped to build brands like Whole Foods Market and Discovery Channel. And so that really is the, is the spirit in which I ask you to receive the presentation today and ultimately my book when it comes out next spring. Okay, so John M. Burke, Arizona John Major Burke. Um, we're all familiar with his name, although largely uh, as a kind of a footnote to the man and the legend that we are celebrating here this week. To the extent that Burke is recalled at all in larger circles, it, it's usually as a clever, charismatic, portly, nomadic, uh, sombrero-wearing, soothsaying schmoozer. Uh, in fact, very much uh, as he was depicted in Robert Altman's uh, 1976 film by the actor Kevin McCarthy. This compellingly cornucopious canary is curvaceous cadenza in the companion of classical chansons. This collation of champagne and columbine is cultivated while the maturest Colorado is <laughs> Lucille Dussard. 
course. <laughs> now, you know that that is an unrealistic portrayal because words never failed the major. For me, though, I would tell you that Burke is really a, a more significant figure than that, uh, and he's somebody who should be carved into the headwall of the figurative Mount Rushmore of marketing. Uh, yes, he was jovial and blustery and an embellisher and an inveterate self-promoter, but the sophistication of his promotional strategy, what we would today call marketing strategy, really was decades ahead of its time. Now, during his life, the word marketing was not a noun, it was a present participle. It meant nothing more than to go to market, to shop. Uh, I'm, I'm going marketing in town. And that's hard for those of us living today in a world in which uh, lives are spun out as alternative facts and uh, we see uh, ads on non-commercial public radio and urinals alike. And the average American is exposed to about 5,000 ads per day. But that is indeed the world uh, that, uh, that Burke lived in. So that said, let me um, have uh, Sherman and Mr. Peabody uh, crank up the Wayback Machine for us and let's uh, take a trip back to that, that world uh, in the mid-19th century to the very headwaters of the marketing industry itself. And let's dial in, say, 1842, which was the year of John M. Burke's birth. Now, most Americans in 1842 still lived in a world without electricity, without railroads, without the telephone, the telegraph, even the camera. Messages could only be transmitted from one town to another by handwritten letters, usually transported by the speediest transportation available, which would have been horse. Towns were separated from each other by days and by miles. Uh, there were no large markets. There were no consumer goods. There were very few branded goods. In fact, it has been estimated that until 1840, more goods were produced in the United States in homes than in factories. Now, it is true that Barnum was already attracting large crowds to his museum in Lower Manhattan and to traveling spectacles like his tours of uh, General Tom Thumb and in 1850 of Jenny Lind, but there were no large organized spectator sports or other forms of entertainment yet. There were also not very many newspapers at the time that John M. Burke was born. Uh, a lot of that was because of technological limitations. This was a very uh, difficult, slow, convoluted process. Uh, the presses uh, had to be run by hand. Uh, the plates had to be inked. Uh, the type composited. The sheets stacked all by hand. They could not produce more than 200 or 300 of them per hour. And moreover, what they were printing on was, uh, was very difficult. Uh, typically, they used cotton or flax fiber that was derived from rags. To, to make newsprint. Uh, rags were in short supply. In fact, in 1850, the United States had to import 21 million pounds of rags from Europe, and so they soon began to look for all kinds of alternatives for things that you might be able to make newsprint out of. Marshmallows, bananas, spider webs, even Egyptian mummies, of which it was estimated that some 500 million might exist and could somehow be imported into the United States. Uh, moreover, it was, of course, an overwhelmingly agricultural time period. Uh, there was uh, a lot of illiteracy. 69% uh, of the workforce worked on farms at this time period. So if you add all of these factors together, uh, it's very clear that there was no marketing culture in the United States because there was nothing to market, and there was really no means for doing that kind of marketing. Well. All of that began to change shortly after Burke's birth, mid-century. We had the uh, first commercial telegraph line came in in 1846. Of course, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell told Watson to come here in 1876. You know what happened after that. Uh, daguerreotypes and carte de visites enabled people to sort of stop time and share images of distant places and people. And soon thereafter, in 1880, the halftone process was invented so that images could be reproduced in newspapers. And Edison started providing indoor electric lighting in 1882. It kind of turned night into day, and then the electrical energy was harnessed to, to uh, drive motors and fuel the Industrial Revolution. So it was, in essence, a new world of analogs in which one did not have to be present to have a presence. Your words, your picture, your voice, your works could be in two places simultaneously or transmitted very rapidly, sometimes instantaneously, 
from one point to another. So that is the world into which John M. Burke launched his career as a press agent, first with a number of different theatrical concerns and traveling troops, one of which was Buffalo Bill's combination, and then starting in 1883 with Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Now, as a side note, in the marketing industry, of which, as I say, I've spent most of my career, uh, the tools change with great rapidity. Uh, so in my career, for example, um, I have relied at various times on uh, direct mail campaigns, radio campaigns, the 30-second radio spot, uh, uh, freestanding inserts in newspapers, loyalty programs, uh, social media, on and on and on. In Burke's time, there was one tool. That was the newspaper, but he wielded it like a Swiss army knife. Uh, Burke was, first of all, a fabulous raconteur. He could hold an audience with rapt attention with his stories of the road, of the engines, of Buffalo Bill, of his own daring do. He knew everyone. He befriended everyone. And we know this in part uh, because of a really remarkable career retrospective article that he wrote in 1916. It was published in the New York Clipper, 4,700 words, in which he name-dropped an astonishing 400 different friends of his from throughout his career. Uh, Burke would travel from town to town two weeks out ahead of the show, and uh, he would often ar arrive by rail late at night. He would go right on over to uh, the newspaper office, and he'd uh, look up his buddies there, his editors that he'd known from earlier days, and He'd smoke a cigar and he'd tell them some of his stories and then of course those stories would end up magically in the newspaper the next day or the, or the day after that. So Burke, he made them laugh, he made them cry, he made them break out their Roger's thesaurus. Uh, he, was, he was quite a popular figure among the newspaper fraternity. The full extent of the major's success in generating ink for the show really was never understood uh, in, in his time or I would say uh, in the uh, century, or almost century and a half since then, until now. And the reason for that is because of this massive digitization effort that has now been going on over the last uh, decade or so, which has enabled Burke's fingerprints to suddenly start materializing like the photographs in a darkroom fixer bath, ghosting up out of the darkness. Burke was not the first press agent, he was not the first advanced man out there, but what set him apart was a, a preternatural sense of the importance of the West and the, and the stories that would resonate with people at this time. You know that upon his uh, supposed first meeting with Cody in 1869 out on the Missouri River, that from that moment, Burke seemed to innately understand the potential for uh, an icon of the fading West in Burke. He, he referred to him as having a halo of glory. There's that word halo again that, that you heard uh, Jim use earlier. Burke seemed to know that even though at this time the West was being promoted as uh, sort of, it, it was being boomed as the scene of future potential, right? This was the land of, of great mineral wealth and arable lands because of course rain would follow the plow uh, and, and great fortune was just a, a railroad spur line away. Uh, that was the way that the West was generally being marketed from early in the 19th century up until this time. Burke didn't see it that way. For Burke, the marketing potential in the West was not in the future, it was in the past. He understood that there was a, a sentimentality to it and a certain sense of reminiscence that would sell and that would ultimately put fannies in seats. And so for 45 years, he put Cody in the vanguard of that marketing effort and he tried to to tap into that wellspring of emotion uh, and educate people about the, the epic struggle and the development of the American character. Uh, now, in order to generate that sort of newspaper coverage, Burke went to extraordinary lengths. Uh, he vigorously and ingeniously produced, uh, for example, celebrity endorsements. Uh, the first of those you probably know about in the second year of the show in 1884, um, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, came to visit the show twice in the same week in Elmira, and he then wrote a letter to Cody, and he told him how much he'd enjoyed it. It was authentic. It reminded him of his days growing up in, in, in Missouri. And then magically, Burke got a hold of that letter, saw that there was marketing gold in it, and it started to be reproduced in newspapers around the country over the course of the next few months. 
Following that, Burke would solicit attaboys from members of the military. Uh, their suspiciously familiar sounding wording from note to note shows that Burke was clearly pulling the marionette strings there. And he utilized these in posters and books and interviews and in the show programs themselves. And then, of course, he would use even Queen Victoria's visit to the show in Earl's Court in 1887 as an implicit endorsement. And there would follow a uh, published list and even this poster of distinguished personages who had visited the show, including a rather dour-looking HRH, the Queen, uh, at the very top of the poster. Burke also invented what we would now call the press junket. He offered reporters unique access and, and one-of-a-kind experiences riding in the Deadwood stage, not just in the show, but sometimes from downtown to the show uh, in the Deadwood stage. He set up these breakfasts and luncheons where uh, they had a chance to experience an authentic Western meal, and they would be uh, enjoying, enjoying oxen roasted on a spit on um, plates uh, with uh, no utensils used at all. So this was the sort of thing that Burke did there. He repeatedly uh, staged photo ops. Uh, he also invented what I would call the press kit. This is a holding here in the library. And uh, in this, it was really ingenious. They would write stories, uh, and they would uh, bind them into this press kit. And as they would go into a town, they would hand these out uh, to a reporter and say, look, you are guaranteed that this is the only time this story is going to be run in this town. I'm ripping it out for you right now. Uh, Burke had a tremendous sense of humor. Um, this appealed to the reporters as well. Um, some of that came through in these uh, photos that he staged, uh, these iconic shots that uh, sort of juxtaposed the old and the old or the old and the new, uh, Indians in cars, Burke next to airplanes, everybody together in a Venetian gondola, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so those were all some of the, the innovations that, um, that Burke brought to uh, the marketing effort of the Wild West. Now, I want to uh, just kind of skip ahead to a couple of things here. You've heard a lot about the posters today, so really no need to, uh, to talk about that, other than to say that that was an effort on a scale unlike anything that we have seen today. You can talk about billboards and outdoor advertising, but nothing compared to what they were doing back then. Uh, Burke's sense of humor also came through in some of what he did uh, in the show programs. You will note in this program, um, I think this is 1895, um, that um, the cowboy uh, on this uh, cover here looks very familiar to us, <laughs> despite the fact that earlier in the same show season, the cowboy looked a little bit different. Uh, this was what Burke was, uh, was able to do. And um, in 1910, he also seems to have been the dastardly mastermind behind a brilliant licensing scheme with the American Caramel Company. Uh, that would help to promulgate uh, Cody's legend as a member of the Old West. This was a 20-card a trading card set, and it featured some legitimate uh, legends of the Old West. So you had Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone and Custer and Sitting Bull. Uh, of course, Cody himself was a part of the set. Uh, but there were also three other members of this set um, that uh, really were just there to promote the Wild West and Cody. One of them was Pawnee Bill. Uh, who was a Westerner, but not of the same ilk and prominence as these others. One was Yellow Hair, uh, whose fame essentially was because of his scalp at this point. And the other one was John M. Burke himself. Uh, in, yes, he had some early uh, success in Western scouting, but uh, really he became the first and last PR guy to appear on a baseball card. So ultimately, how are we to, uh, to gauge Burke's legacy? It's, uh, it's kind of hard to say. Some of the historians have excused him as being a comical charlatan and, and what have you. He certainly did manage to generate a lot of press, but ultimately he failed in publicizing perhaps his most important subject, which was himself. Uh, twice, in 1899 in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and then in 1902 in the New York Times, Burke made it abundantly clear that although Born an Easterner, he wanted to be buried right here in the Bighorn Mountains on McCullough's Peak in a little place that was called Burke's Bluff. Uh, but that did not happen, as you know. He died 93 days after Cody in 1917, and he was uh, ultimately uh, penniless, uh, had no heirs, and so he was buried uh, in an unmarked grave in Washington, D.C. And that was the case for 100 years until four months ago 
when uh, in my determination to begin being a good marketer and promoting my uh, forthcoming book, uh, I gathered uh, Jeremy and Steve Friesen and Michelle Delaney and uh, a thousand people on Facebook Live and we uh, dedicated a gravestone uh, to John M. Burke. And that, of course, spun off its own set of publicity uh, in the Washington Post and in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and some other places like that. So um, I will leave you with that and just to tell you that uh, I'm, I'm so excited that, that Burke's name has come up so frequently in our conversations here today. It shows the importance of him, not just as a contributor to the Wild West and the last image of the American West, but as a pioneer of the marketing industry. Thank you very much. Again, thank you very much. That was an, another really riveting paper. In fact, there's three crackingly good papers this morning. I'm going to ask the speakers to come up. We do have a full 10 minutes at least for any questions. Um, if anyone would like to start the ball rolling. I, I agree, what a wonderful way to start today's groups of sessions. Um, just a couple of quick things first. Michelle, um, we have also at the Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave uh, some uh, original poster artwork with notations on it as well. So we'll have to make a connection regarding that. I know we couldn't make it happen, but we'll make it happen. Anyway, also, uh, it's kind of interesting. James, I, I very much enjoyed the before and after with the articles, and I don't know if you've talked to Joe about this yet, but the before articles seem to, with their florid language and all, to very much reflect John Burke's influence, whereas the after one, it's like, okay, now the local journalists finally get a chance to do it their way, and they're doing it from their perspective, and maybe you've noticed this, but I think that's a wonderful tie-in between what both of you did, and you can state, maybe you figured that out already, but anyway, thanks. Sounds good, and that's a good way to do it. it this was an extraordinary presentation. It, it, it really was on all parts. And this may not be fair, but I'm going to do it anyway. The brilliance of the branding through understanding timing and railroad and transportation and the visual imagery that came out of the posters and the printing and the work of John Burke created a brand for Cody in the West that was incomparable. Please transpose that forward about 120 years to now and branding the West and the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in a way that penetrates the way that these things did. Well, uh, I will tell you, the, uh, this morning um, I went on to newspapers.com and I wanted to find uh, something new about John M. Burke uh, because there's new stuff happening all the time coming up right now with this digitization. <laughs> and there was a little story in there from an Allentown newspaper in 1899 about uh, Burke's uh, visit to uh, Germany and apparently he had been walking down the street and he bumped into three young guys and they were offended and one of them challenged him to a duel. And so uh, Burke, when he realized what was happening, uh, just uh, according to the article, took them and he knocked their three heads together and he pushed them aside. So there is your second reference to the most important brand today and that is the Three Stooges. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I, I really believe that, that the, uh, this notion of branding did not exist at the time that, that um, the geniuses behind the Wild West launched their efforts, and so there was, there was no playbook for it. They did not know how to do that. Uh, today, th there's almost nothing out there comparable. I mean, you could look at things like uh, Cirque du Soleil um, a as an entertainment property that's international, that travels, that's, that's well-known, but uh, it, it, it pales in comparison. Uh, obviously, we've now lost Barnum and Bailey, uh, greatest show on earth uh, after 100 and, what was it? 
40 years uh, in, uh, in May of this year. And so uh, that, that notion of taking branding and applying it to, to entertainment, um, th there's almost nothing out there right now. Of course, they th the the world of communications is so fragmented nowadays, I, I think you couldn't do that. Uh, there's too many distractions and there's too many messages out there, but uh, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that you can look back at the golden age of advertising on Madison Avenue in, in the 60s, the work of David Ogilvy. You could go back to the earlier public relations genius of um, Edward Bernays and Ivy Lee. None of that matches the sort of branding effort that they built in, in creating Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Tim, I think that uh, if we fast forward to today, um, our team that we've been talking about, the Wild West team, would use everything that's available. We'd be all over social media. We'd be doing Facebook Live. We'd be, uh, you know, creating those opportunities wherever they could be. Uh, you know, in, in my very focused work on the, the print work, uh, you know, I, I stay at times very close to the technology that was changing and, and how I can find in the correspondence where the interactions were. But I also think about Cody as a first reality star. You know, and what are those people doing today? You know, do, would he have an app? Would he be on Instagram? You know, you know ha who and who from the team would be organizing that and what kind of images would we see? Would we see the selfies? Would we, you know, all of these things that are happening today uh, would be very exciting, I think, to these, uh, and again, I think they're genius. Uh, and I also think the way that Cody continually recreated himself, way more than average. You know, I never want to hear that word when I, you know, think about Cody and, and what uh, they did because it's very exciting and, and, and I, you know, uh, you and I have talked and others have talked about bringing this history to the public. We are still talking about Cody. There are 36 of us who are actively researching this all the time. And I'm, I'm you know, telling you the truth that I, I want to keep talking about it in Washington and at the Smithsonian and with my colleagues uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, you know, again, doing an international PhD, we are bringing the word out there, and I think the team would have done the same if they had been here in 2017. I'll try to be quick. Um, I, I am aware of an artist named Paul Frenzen. Michelle is shaking her head, and I thought she might. Uh, in a book by Tate, written in 1950, Jules Tavernier and Paul Frenzeni were artists that worked uh, Collier's, I, you know, I don't know, I can't think of Forbes, okay. Anyway, Tavernier died, and this man in 1950, 51, Tate said he lost track of Frenzeni. He didn't know what happened to him. But lo and behold, he shows up on Cody's payroll in the 1890s. Um, and I, just because it's a conundrum, if Tate couldn't find the information, I want somebody in this room to <laughs> to research Frenzeni. <laughs> okay. Okay, good, because Okay, thank you. Uh, Michelle, f first for Michelle, I, I may be misremembering, and Paul Fees uh, and, and Steve Friesen might remember better and, and, and say, no, that, that's wrong, but it seems to me there's correspondence uh, from Cody to Cook, or maybe it's to somebody else, uh, these these letters that uh, where Cody says I've looked at the last batch of posters they're all wrong I've s we, we need it we, if this has to be done again the color is wrong uh, or he'll he'll give other tips like this in other words he controlled the image there were there were professionals he hired to get the job done but he retained a very strong interest in making the look authentic and to make the posters look. Uh, in a way that corresponded with his brand. And, and in my view, that, that's kind of what he does throughout his life. He, 
we, we saw how he picked artists to back who were not the premier, did not go on to become the premier Western artist. But when you look at his correspondence with them, he's constantly criticizing the visual presentation of the figures in the paintings, and he wants changes. I mean, that comes up all the time. And in the arena, he's constantly on his cowboys in the rehearsals. You're doing it wrong. I want it done this way. Get on the horse. Do it again. Right, and that they say he was a real taskmaster in presenting the way it was all supposed to look. And I think that too often when we talk about the publicity of the show, I, th I thought this was a fantastic uh, talk you gave us today, but it's really hard to get across how, first of all, how big an operation it was, but that at the end of the day, he was the one you answered to when you produced a product for the show. If he didn't like it, it wasn't going up on the wall. Um, and then, uh, Joe, the, the, the material on the, on the on Burke is just great. And one of the things that I always thought about Burke that uh, is so easy to miss is that newspapers in the time were desperate for good content. I mean, it's really hard to get a good story. And Burke could walk into your office, sit down, and tell 12 stories in a row, just like the one you did about the, you told us about knocking the heads together of the men on the street in Germany. Um, and then at the end of the day, make it loop back to Colonel Cody and the wonders of the Wild West show. And he's just so much fun to have around because he made your job so much easier, right? And he was himself such a fantastic storyteller, as you point out. And, and thank you for, I think, reminding us that this, as Patty was talking about the humor in the Wild West yesterday, um, that program cover you showed us where he slips his own picture in as the cowboy, that's classic. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be quick on this one. I just see an interesting, wonderful op-ed piece waiting, Joe, of a Sean Spicer, maybe, comparison to <laughs> Burke. And uh, that doesn't have to be that, but just something. I just feel like you were so ready for an op-ed piece that would be good-natured, but might take on and give us our footing on that. So I wanted to describe that. And then the, uh, this is a small item, Jim, but I was just amazed that the horses played so little, and your word cloud things, or it just seemed like, for me, the magic of so much of the imagery in the shows is the horses, and to see, that I don't think they were even there in the first round, and to see that they're just tiny there, is it just that that was an era where horses were just part of what you saw every day? I just, I, it's a, a small thing, but it just seemed very then and now as a comparison, and then uh, a little bit in the same line with my question to Joe, Michelle, that uh, you seem very well positioned to guide young people, or or ancient people um, in looking at advertisements and not just saying, well, it's all nonsense and misrepresentation, but figuring out how to navigate through that. So, so those are not exactly intertwined questions, but uh, in fact, horses just are out there by themselves on that one. But that, those were things that I was really curious about. So yeah, I was surprised as well that there wasn't more references to the horses because as you read the text, there is um, some commentary on them and they do appear a little bit. Uh, some of it, I think you're right, is that they're still commonplace. You know, the automobile was a rarity at this time. Horses were the principal means of transportation. Uh, this was still a, a community surrounded by farms. It still is now. You know, many of these many of these towns are. Um, uh, and then uh, the other bit I'd say is in terms of generating reviews, this is, these are very hurriedly put together pieces for the evening edition or for the next morning edition. And so that's part of why you get, I think, a lot of very um, sort of event-based descriptions. Yeah, one, one other uh, great invention of Burke uh, really was the op-ed, as far as I'm concerned, because when you, when you read the newspapers of the era carefully, you see that any time anybody said anything, that ran afoul of Burke's positioning of the show or of Cody, anything, the slightest offense, uh, a rumor that the show had failed in Germany, a rumor that uh, Bill Crawford, uh, Bill Mathewson in uh, Kansas was the original Buffalo Bill, anything like that, there's Burke right on the spot, immediately firing off a letter to the editor, or in many cases, a bylined piece that the newspapers would run because they all loved him. And, you know, that's, 
that's reputation management. You know, that's what we call it today. That's what uh, the Sean Spicers of the world uh, are supposedly doing, uh, but nobody was doing it before John M. Burke. I know you've got the PhD and I'm still a year out. <laughs> I wanted to say something about at mentoring and uh, hopefully inspiring the next generation of, of Cody scholars. You'll hear more about that in the session that uh, I'm moderating with Jeremy and, and Doug and, and Rebecca and John this afternoon. But I think as we begin to uh, dissect, decipher, interpret uh, the work and the advertising that went into Wild West in an even bigger way, and these publications come out, uh, our work with the University of Oklahoma and other presses to make sure that the material is getting out, and the inclusion on uh, Cody Archive and Cody Studies for all of that we continue to talk to each other. Those of us in the room are corresponding more with each other, and we're also meeting with students as we go out and lecture across the country as well.